In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Amen. Christ is in our midst. Thank you. I greet you on this second Sunday of the season of preparation for Holy Nativity. I want to continue to encourage you with your fasting. And remember, not just fasting from certain kinds of food and eating less, so that you can travel lightly like those wise men who went to see Jesus. We're not just wise when we, do, when we do certain things outwardly, but we're wise when we're transformed inwardly. You can say that doing flows from being, and what we're seeking ultimately here is purity of heart, a simplicity, a holiness. There's a, remember, we're called to be like children. We're called to be like children. Of such is the kingdom of God. Children who are simple, who know who their parents are, who follow their parents wherever they go. They say in child development that when babies and children are little, their parents are their world, their reality. And that's what our relationship with God should be like, our reality. Your parents are the ones who feed you. Your parents are the ones who tell you what's right and what's wrong. Your parents are the ones who have given you life and give you affirmation and comfort. That's how a relationship with God should be. He's the one who feeds us. He's the one who helps discern what's right and what's wrong. He's the one ultimately in whom we find our comfort and our identity and For those of us who have fallen, who have fallen in this world, have you ever made a mistake or sinned? Yeah? Never? I have. Can you come up and preach that? No. (laughs) For those of us who have fallen, who have made mistakes, He's our redemption and our comfort. Just like the mother and the father who lift up their child. And we're trying to return to that simplicity because, as we mentioned last week, we're so consumed by our consumption, we're so emboldened by our excesses that we forget where we're from and who we are. And there's another reminder of this in today's gospel reading. A man who is living as if just for the sake for this world. You could say a worldly, merely worldly existence. Although you know we love the world that we live in because we believe that this creation is by God's hand. And there's an inherent goodness in all of it. But, of course, when we treat it like an end in itself, we seek to see, excuse me, we we fail to see the forest for the trees, and we fail to see God for the creation, or for our addiction to satisfaction and to worldly goods. And so we hear about this rich man today, In a parable, remember, this is the Lord speaking to us, so he wants us to hear this lesson. Blessed with abundance and treating it as if it were his own. I don't have enough space to store all that I have. I guess I need bigger barns to store what I have so that I can relax. And enjoy my life and drink and be merry. Of course, then that night, his soul is called forth. Your soul is required from you, God said to him. And the things that you have pre- prepared, whose will they be? He who lay, so it is, for he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Christ is reminding us that we need to be more attached to him than to the world more attached to the giver of the gift rather than the gift itself. We see a couple of vices represented in this. Avarice, like love of stuff, and uh, what the fathers refer to as akadia, or some people say asedia, akadia, or complacency, a kind of complacency. And a lot of times they go hand in hand. We cling to material things. That's for sure. They give us a sense of 
comfort. They give us a sense of identity. I remember hearing a story about a broken young person who was being brought into care. All they had was a little memento. I don't know what it was from. It was a little coin. A little coin holding, that they held in their hand. They had been moved around so many times due to their illness and their condition that the last and only thing that this poor young man had was this little coin. Who knows it was given to him from his parents or something. He said the strength with which he was holding that little memento from his hand was so powerful that several of the workers could not even pry it forth from his hand. One little thing. Not even a massive bank account or barns full of grain, but one little thing. I've heard it said that someone could own multiple possessions and be free of them. Someone could have very little things and be totally possessed by the few things that he has because he hasn't united himself to God in the depths of his being and understood that everything that is good and perfect comes from above. We cling to material things, and that's part of our problem, but we also cling to immaterial things. These are things that we cling to that cannot be rent from our hands even because they're hidden deep within our hearts. They make us stingy. Stingy. With Stinginess ultimately is not just about lacking material generosity. Stinginess is ultimately about withholding love from other people. And if we are Christians, if we are trying to align ourselves with Christ, we're trying to align ourselves with that love that goes forth, that gives without fear. Fear, when we let go, if I give that coin away, I fear well, that I may never get it back or get something else as good or equivalent. But this kind of avaricious uh, stinginess is really, it is about our attachment to material things to some extent. But it's born from a lack of trust, sometimes through being wounded by other people. Holding on to what we have while we have it for as long as we can. For fear of losing it, rather than understanding and trusting and knowing that we are ultimately loved by God. And as, the, as Job said, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. There are corruptible riches and there are incorruptible riches. And the ones that are corruptible are fleeting. The ones that are incorruptible are the ones that can be buried, bore deep inside of us and bring forth fruit of goodness. Remember the teaching of St. Paul from Romans 14. The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. Not barns full of grain or bank accounts full of money, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. I thought this is where a lot of heretical preachers could go wrong and say, and that's why I'm telling you to empty your bank today and give me all of your money and I'll pray for you. No. But I am telling you, don't be stingy. But I'm not merely talking about material stinginess, not withholding your attention. We use our attention a lot of times as a way of manipulating and controlling situations, rewarding and punishing other people. You ever heard of stonewalling? When you're upset with someone? One of the greatest, seems like one of the greatest things you can do to hold your ground is to stonewall them, is to treat them as if they're not there, to refuse to speak with them, because ultimately that's the depersonalization of the other person. I'm treating you as if you don't exist right now. Incredibly tragic form of manipulation. A lot of times, though, beloved, it is born from our own brokenness. 
I'm not saying there isn't a reason you do it. You do it because it works to some extent, but usually you repent of it because you realize you need the other, especially those you love. I'm encouraging you today and this week to be generous. If you lack generosity, then don't be stingy. Give a buck to the guy, to the panhandler, and don't worry about where it goes. Make eye contact with someone. Look up and see them. And don't be afraid to be seen by them as well. And say hi. You're looking at someone created in the image of God. Be generous with your kindness. And with your time. This week, during a season where we're trying to put less into ourselves. Less. And food is one of the easiest things to fill our selves and our time with. One of the few things we can control when we're trying to put less into ourselves, one way to counteract that addiction to satisfaction is to find satisfaction in seeking to serve others. Look for opportunities this week to get out of your seat, to get up off of the couch or wherever you may be, Turn off the phone, close the computer, stand up and do something for another person and say, God, be glorified with this little action. Let them know that they are loved. Let them know that they're loved. Let them know that they're loved by you. Let them know that I see them and that I care for them and that I want to, do, to overcome my selfishness in order to see the other. The way to overcome avarice and the way to overcome complacency is to give, to arise, to actively love. Love is not ideological. Have you ever been guilty of saying, oh, I'll pray for you, and then not praying for that person? Have you ever done that? Oh, I'll pray. You intend to. Nice, it's a good intention. But it's an empty, it's like a a balloon without air in it. Look at my balloon. Oh, neat. So follow through with actively loving people. Say, Say that you will pray for them and then pray for them. Stand up, make the sign of the cross. Ask that the Lord would grant them His love and His great mercy. Not just while you're eating a sandwich or surfing the internet. A tofu sandwich, maybe. Yeah? I don't know. I don't think I've had a tofu sandwich. PB&J. But arise and pray for them selflessly. It's incredible how God chooses and desires to work. God desires to work through the sacrificial love of His people. In subtle ways, in unseen ways, and in beautiful ways. I remember coming to this thought once that if we seek opportunities to do do acts of kindness in unseen ways, subtle and unseen ways, then our eyes will be opened to the miracles that God is doing all around us that we fail to see, especially when we seek to do those acts of kindness and pursue those opportunities right within our own homes. So the way to overcome this avarice, this akadia, this complacency and despondency is by giving our time, our attention, and even being generous monetarily to those who are in need. And to be generous without regret. To give, your, to give of yourself And not question it, but to do it freely. Ultimately, to love. But this week, again, I'm encouraging you on this second week of the Nativity Fast, be generous in the ways that you can. 
So that by fasting from sin and selfishness, you can overcome your own fear of loving others. And you can understand that love is the only thing that remains forever. Remember the words of the Holy Apostle Paul. Now abide faith, hope and love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. And through our kindness, through our hope in Christ, through the fulfillment that can only be found in him, we can be those beacons of this holy trinity of virtues, of faith, hope and love. I pray, beloved in Christ, that God will grant you the strength, the resolve, and the conviction to do that this week. Don't be stingy. If we bind ourselves to the earth, and to our love of the earth, then even all the angels in heaven could not hoist us up to heaven. But if we divest ourselves of that which merely binds us to the world, out of love for others, we become weightless. We become Christ-like. We become free. My prayer, beloved, is in Christ is that during this beautiful season that we're in, that we would discover that freedom and remember, lose count of the acts of kindness. He who endures, he who endures, we hear in the Holy Scripture, he who endures, but I would also say, repents and ultimately loves. He who loves to the end will be saved. May God accomplish this in our lives through the grace of the Holy Spirit, that we may glorify Him always, now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen.